Uh, so hello everyone, welcome to the European Non-Associative Algebra Seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, Esther Garcia from Universidad Rey Carlos, Madrid. And she will talk on new Bolton plus regular elements. So please. Hello, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of speaking here this afternoon and telling you part of my research. So uh, let me explain okay, a little bit how this is going to be organized. So I will start with a short introduction. Then uh, to justify the title of, uh, of my talk, which is Nilpotent Last Regular Elements, I will explain uh, what we were studying when we found this type of elements, which was a classification of nilpotent elements in, in the algebras. There we find a special type of elements that we call nilpotent last regular, and we realized that uh, there was a lot of information that could be extracted for, from such elements. So we decided to follow uh, a deep study of them. And then we went back to our original problem, which was the classification and the study of a certain type of uh, inner derivations in, in the algebras and uh, had uh, some study some other applications of uh, this type of elements. So as a first uh, slide, I would like to present not only me, not only myself, but the group of people I, I work with. Uh, the first one is uh, Miguel Gómez Lozano from the University of Málaga. Uh, we've been working together for more than 20 years. And the other three people in this slide are our former students. Uh, the two in the middle are uh, Guillermo Vera and Ruben Muñoz. They both uh, were supervised by, by Miguel and by myself, and they defended their PhDs in 2021, I think. And uh, the last one is uh, Jose Brox. He is now uh, a postdoc in Valladolid, I think, after being postdoc in Coimbra. And uh, he, he did his PhD under the supervision of Miguel, and uh, Antonio Fernandez Lopez, uh, both from the University of Malaga. And uh, what I'm going to present this afternoon is joint work of all of us. So uh, what's our context? Uh, for us, R always uh, will denote either a ring or an associative algebra or a ring of scalars. Uh, our usual assumption is that one half is invertible in the ring of scalars or that the ring has no two torsion. And uh, to get the definition of an important last regular element, we combine two classical notions. The first one is a uh, nilpotency. We say that an element A in the ring R is nilpotent is the, if there exists a natural number such that a to the n is zero. And if the previous power is non-zero, we call such an n the index of, an, of nil potency of the element. And a apparently different notion that has nothing to do with nil potency is the notion of von Neumann regularity. An element in a ring is von Neumann regular if there exists another element in the ring such that a b a equals a. And I have put here an implies, this is not direct, but the element can always be replaced by another one such that it not only, it not only satisfies A, B, A equals to A, but also B, A, B equals B. So whenever um, one thinks of von Neumann regular, we normally assume these two conditions. There exists an element B that behaves more or less I try to think of B such a, like an inner inverse. So A and B are somehow one, the inverse of the other one, if we don't have a, a unit. Okay. And the, the notion of nilpotent last regular, the, the name was given for by us, so it's, it, it's not classical. The definition the, is ours. Uh, we say that an element is nilpotent last regular if, on the one hand, it is nilpotent, and on the other hand, the last non-zero power of the element is regular. So 
it's like a combination of these two facts being nilpotent and the last non-zero power being non-zero being a uh, von Neumann regular. So the question is where do these type of elements appear? So how can we find them? And for us, they first appear when we were studying or trying to classify uh, adnilpotent elements in Lie algebras. So uh, we were uh, studying uh, Lie algebras coming from associative. So when, when you always, when, when we have a, a ring or an associative algebra, uh, we can uh, always think of the induced Lie algebra R minus with the Lie bracket, the usual one, X, Y minus Y, X. And if the ring or if the associative algebra has an involution, we can also think of the uh, skew-symmetric elements with respect to the involution, which is a subalgebra of R minus. And these are, for us, two very important Lie algebras where we normally study properties. Uh, the, by add of A, we denote the usual adjoint map. So add of X of of A of an element is the Lie bracket A comma X. It is an inner derivation. And we say that an element in the, a Lie algebra, one of these, or in general, an element in a Lie algebra is ad nilpotent if the adjoint map is nilpotent. And we say that an ad nilpotent element has a certain index if the adjoint map is nilpotent of such an index. In this series of works, uh, the first one is joint work with Jose Brox and Miguel Gomez Lozano, and in the second and in the third one, also uh, Guillermo Vera and uh, Ruben Muñoz join us in the study. We were very interested in studying uh, this type of elements. How are adnilpotent elements in Lie algebras coming from associative when the associative uh, structure is semi-prime. In the first work, we were only studying unimportant elements of index at most three. And the reason is that we had previously introduced a construction that attached a Jordan algebra to unimportant elements of index at most three of a Lie algebra. And since we were interested in knowing how those Jordan algebras were, we first needed to understand how unimportant elements of index at most three behave. And afterwards, we decided to extend that study not only to index three, but unimportant in general. Uh, uh, the study of unimportant elements is uh, not new at all. And I think we can go back to the works of Herstein in 1963, when he proved that uh, an important elements of index N in a simple ring are more or less well, modulo an element of the center nilpotent element. So uh, it is enough to subtract an element in the center of the ring to obtain an important element. Uh, later on, uh, uh, this work was extended by Martin Dale and Mears in 1983 to prime rings, but uh, when moving to the prime context, uh, the notion of center of the ring had to be replaced by the extended centroid. And in a second work in 1991, uh, both Martin Dale and Mears also described unimportant elements in the Lie algebra of skew symmetric elements of a prime ring with involution. I want also, but well, there are a lot of works dealing with uh, uh, unimportant elements, but I would like also to highlight uh, the work of T.K. Lee in 2018, uh, where he published the description of unimportant elements of the skew uh, symmetric elements of a semi prime ring with involution which is more or less the same object we were studying at the same time. But uh, we were using a different approach. And uh, as I think it, uh, we gave a closer look at, at nilpotent elements because uh, we obtained better conditions on the torsion of the ring to fully classify nilpotent elements. And to do so, 
we have to introduce a, a notion that only makes sense in semi-prime. In prime rings, it, it doesn't make sense. And it's the notion of pure nil potency. So uh, we gave the, this definition for elements, uh, adnil potent elements in R and for adnil potent elements in the skew symmetric elements. And uh, just let me tell you what it is. Since we need to move uh, to the standard centroid, because uh, as I saw in the previous um, slide, if you are dealing with prime structures, the center has to be replaced by the standard centroid. If we are in semi-prime, with more reason, we have to deal with the standard centroid. And we wanted to control the adnel potency of the elements. Uh, we say that an element is pure adnel potent of a certain index if whenever it is seen extended, extending scalars by element of the centroid, the, this extended element is adnil potent of the same index. And a similar notion can be done for skew-symmetric elements. A, an element is pure adnil potent of index n if a, lambda a is adnil potent of the same index whenever lambda a is non-zero and lambda is a symmetric element of the standard central. This uh, is just a very technical condition because every adnil potent element, in fact, can be expressed as a sum of pure adnil potent elements of decreasing indices. So if we are able to classify pure adnil potent elements, then we will be able to obtain the classification of adnil potent elements in general. And the dealing of this uh, precise index will help us to fix the torsion of what we are trying to do in this model. So uh, with this notion, we were able to uh, classify an important elements of uh, Lie algebras of tau with R minus, obtaining a result very similar to that of uh, Martin de Lamiers. If R is pure adnil potent uh, of index N, and we define T as the integer part of N plus one over two. It is enough to require that R is free of T torsion and the combinatorial number N over T torsion to obtain that the index of adnil potency has to be odd and the element modulo the extended centroid is nil potent of index t. And from this result, since every uh, ad nil potent element is a sum of pure nil potent elements, we recover the result uh, published by TK Lee, where he directly uh, required to the ring to have to be free of n factorial torsion. As a second step, we uh, study at important elements of skew symmetric elements of a semi prime ring. We focused on pure and important elements. And uh, as before, we define T to be the integer part of n plus one over two. We uh, require that the ring was free of uh, T and uh, the factorial number n over T torsion. And then we obtain the following. Uh, there are uh, four possibilities. The first one is that n is congruent to zero modulo four. In this case, the element is a uh, nil potent of index t plus one, because we can prove that a to the t is non-zero. And what is very important is that we obtain a generalized polynomial identity in a corner of the ring. A second type, uh, can be found when n is congruent to one modulo four, and this more or less behaves that uh, an important elements of the whole R because modulo an element of the standard centroid, these elements are nilpotent. The case n congruent to two modulo four is never possible, and when n is congruent to three modulo four, the element can be decomposed with respect to an idempotent into two pieces. One of them, the first one, behaves as in case one, 
it is nil potent of index t, t plus one and defines, defines a generalized polynomial identity at a certain corner of the ring. And the other part behaves as type two because it is modulo an element in the standard centroid a, a directly nilpotent of index t. So when looking at this uh, classification, we realize that when we are in case one and when we are in case 4.1, the, the situations where a is nilpotent of index t plus one, the element when seen as an ad nilpotent element of the skew symmetric elements or when seen as an ad nilpotent element of the whole R, had different indices of ad nilpotency. Uh, in SQ of R, had index N, but in R, would have index N plus one or N plus two. And we decided to focus on these elements and see if we could say something else about them. So uh, just to, to to set what sort of elements we are interested in are uh, elements, we call them of a skew index. They only appear when n is congruent to zero or when n is congruent to three modulo four. They are nipotent of index t plus one. Uh, the element when seen as an ad nilpotent element of the whole R has higher index of ad nilpotency. It can be n plus one or n plus two. Uh, a to the power t generates an essential ideal in R, and a couple of identities appear. They are similar, but not exactly the same. When n is congruent to zero modulo four, and when n is congruent to three modulo four. So the existence of these uh, kind of uh, identities suggested us to move to the symmetric Martindale ring of quotients, because we believe that the symmetric Martindale ring of quotient is a better place to study generalized polynomial identities. So if we denote by S the symmetric Martindale ring of quotients of R, in this ring, the involution of R uh, can be extended. So it is an over ring where the involution can be extended and uh, would prove that if we have an ad nilpotent element of a certain index skew index of the skew symmetric elements of R, it is also an ad nilpotent element of the same skew index when considered as a symmetric element of the symmetric Martindale ring of quotients. It is nilpotent of index T plus one. And what is more important, the last non-zero power of the element is von Neumann regular. So here is the place where we found nilpotent last regular elements. SQ, uh, uh, at nilpotent elements of SQ index gave rise, gave rise to nilpotent elements whose last non-zero power was regular. So now I can go to the main part of this talk which is, let us study how these elements are. How are elements that are on one side nilpotent and whose last non-zero power is von Neumann regular? Okay, here we are. Now our ring will be R as, as always. And suppose that we have uh, such an element, an element which is nilpotent of certain index, let's put a T plus one, and such that a to the t is von Neumann regular. In that situation, we have these two properties in general, because as I told you in one of the first slides, uh, well, this is the definition of uh, von Neumann regularity. It can be easily adapted to have these two conditions, but when the element, the original element is also nilpotent, the element B can be adjusted, it's not the, the, the one you obtain at the first step, so it can be adjusted such that it not only satisfies this two first condition, but it, as I think, is that it kills everything you put in the middle. The only thing you can put here to obtain something non-zero is the power A to the T. If you put something higher, 
it is zero because the element is important. And if you put something smaller, even a to the zero. So it can be b squared is zero, b a b is zero, b a squared b is zero, etc. How, how um, where does this uh, construction comes from? It is not ours. This construction was first done by the standing induction in a paper in 1997, where my colleague uh, Miguel was uh, participating as a student, I think, at that time. And uh, the construction was, was done by Eulalia Garcia Ruz. And uh, in honor to her, she, she died around 10, 10 years ago, we decided to call these elements, an element B such that satisfies all these conditions, the rules inverse of the element A. Later on, we found a similar construction done by Levitsky in a paper in 1953 with more restrictive uh, hypothesis, but if you go into the proof of how to get the element, the construction is more or less the same. And as another um, remark, I want to tell you that I have put uh, the word A and not the word D because nilpotent last regular elements may have different rules inverse. The construction is just a construction, but it doesn't give a unique rules inverse. An element, an nilpotent last regular element can have different rules inverse. An example to understand. So uh, suppose that our ring is a matrix ring uh, of size T plus one, and let's just pick a, a big Jordan block. So A, is nilpotent, it is a, a Jordan block is with a, a ones in the second diagonal, so it is nilpotent of index C plus one because of the size of the matrix. And a, matrix rings are von Neumann regular, so the condition of being nilpotent plus regular is, is direct. And who can be a rules inverse for this matrix? Well, just putting a little one just in the other corner. If uh, you consider these two matrices, the original matrix to the power t plus one is zero, a t b a t recovers a t, b a t b recovers b. But if you have, if you put in the middle a to powers lower than t, you always get the zero matrix. So. This B is a rules inverse for the element A. This construction, indeed, the original construction given by Lali Garcia Ruz, was done in the context of Jordan algebras, but she was studying, they were studying uh, Jordan algebras of a Hermitian type. So the original construction uh, was done for sym a symmetric element whose power was also, whose non -zero, last non-zero power was symmetric, and the rules inverse they produced was symmetric. But everything can, can be done with a, with a little curve. Uh, if your original matrix, if your original element is symmetric or skew-symmetric, and the last non-zero power is symmetric, uh, you can adjust B to be symmetric, and uh, uh, for such a uh, rules inverse, we call it star rules inverse because it's somehow compatible with involution. If the last non zero power of the element is skew symmetric, then you can adjust the rules inverse to be skew symmetric. And furthermore, if your original algebra is graded with respect to some group, and your um, nilpotent uh, last regular element is homogeneous, you can uh, find a rules inverse, which is also homogeneous, and it falls in the component labeled by g, g minus t, if this is labeled by g. Okay. Uh, what do we also have when we have this uh, nilpotent last regular element and you have a rules inverse? You can produce a set of matrix units. And I have to say that 
I think this was the point of view of Levisky. He produced directly a set of matrix units out pro, uh, from an important element with certain conditions. So uh, if you define uh, elements uh, of this form where A is the original element and B is the root inverse, if you multiply them, they just behave like, like matrix units. Among all these matrix units, we focus on the diagonal ones, the one that has uh, the, the both uh, indices the same. They, they are idempotents, and because of this property, they are orthogonal, and they do not commute with A, but kind of. When you multiply EI times A, you obtain A, oh, sorry, you obtain A uh, times E with the label move one unit yes. So if instead of multiplying, multiplying the element A by one of these little idempotent, we consider the set of this, uh, we consider the element consisting on the sum of all the idempotents, then the element E and the element A commute. Okay, this idempotent for us will be important in our constructions and we decided to call it the rules idempotent associated to A and to the B, the rules inverse, which means that if you move this rules inverse, the rules idempotent can be moved also. So nor the rules inverse nor the rules idempotent are unique. Nevertheless, we can kind of prove that an important last regular element uh, behave like Jordan blocks because uh, when we have an important last regular element, we take a root inverse, we associate it to A and B, we have the root side important, then the element EA or AE is just the sum of the matrix units appear on the second diagonal. So it is a big Jordan block. The, here, it's very easy to compute powers. So the T power of this element is just moving this one towards the lower position. So A to the T is just a one here. And there is an isomorphism between the corner ERE and a matrix ring and the coefficients of the matrices can be taken in any local algebra of R at any of the matrix units. In our first uh, construction, we always chose here E11, but then we realized that we can put here any matrix unit, consider the local algebra, and this ring, and this other ring is our isomorphic. So, Elements here are in the matrices as this one is here. Let me put you an example. Suppose that now we have an important slash regular element, this A of index three, consisting of two blocks, two Jordan blocks. Uh, the square of this element moves this uh, row of ones towards here and this row of ones towards here. And when you get uh, the third power, you obtain the zero matrix. For this um, an important last regular element, we can choose this uh, rules uh, inverse, just a one here and a little one here. And uh, with these ingredients, uh, let me compute the uh, idempotents E11, E22, and E33. I have used uh, capital letters uh, because by uh, lowercase uh, letters, I, do, I denote the positions of the matrix. So E11 is B times A squared. So it is a one here and a one here. The second idempotent, living in this uh, set of matrix units, I told you in the previous slide, is a one here and a one here. And the third one is a one here and a little the one here. So the root side important in this situation, which is the sum of the three of them, 
is one, 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 and one. It is the identity matrix. So our isomorphism says that the ring ERE, which in this situation is the whole R, can be seen as a ring of matrices of size three. Three is the index of nil potency of nil potency of the nil potent class regular element. So it is a three here, and the coefficients are taken in any local algebra of R at a matrix unit. So if I take, for example, a local al the local algebra at the first uh, idempotent here, this is matrices of size two. The identity here is this block, and my matrix can be seen as a big block of size three with ones in the second diagonal. So this is for us the Jordan canonical form of an nilpotent LR regular element. Everything can be done if you have an involution. Uh, one half is required in the ring of scalars to make things work properly. But apart from that, the previous construction can be done if your original element is um, symmetric or skew-symmetric and it is nilpotent class regular, then uh, you have to choose the root inverse to be compatible with the involution. You, when the, the matrix unit where you do the local algebra has to be symmetric or skew-symmetric to, in order to, to work properly. And then you obtain the isomorphism as before, the ring ERE is isomorphic to a matrix ring of a size T plus one uh, with coefficient in this local algebra. And what is more important is that we can fully describe the involution. Remember that R has an involution. So the involution from R can be taken to an involution in the matrix ring that can be fully described with a product like this, this uh, matrix C is more or less like ones minus ones in the second uh, diagonal. And then the uh, matrix in the middle have to be transposed and involved with respect to, to a certain evolution. But the idea is that you can fully describe the involution in this matrix ring coming from the involution of the original ring with involution. Another important thing about nilpotent plus regular, and it, that's uh, gratings. Uh, whenever you have a nilpotent plus regular element, we have a grading in the ring AR. It is a set grading. How have we done it? Remember that we have a set of matrix rings. Uh, we focus on the matrix rings um, with uh, two labels equals. They are uh, a set of orthogonal idempotents. And then we just relabel them with, them with different indices, but they are the, the, the orthogonal idempotents I have, we had at the beginning. And if this is a complete family of orthogonal idempotents, we directly have a grading. And if it is not complete, let us do it. So. Remember that E is the sum of all these little idempotents. So we have to complete this family with one minus E. And the idea is, is where are we going to put the new idempotent? At the beginning, at the end, in the middle? And the answer, the answer is, it depends. If you have an if number of idempotents here, for example, minus four, minus two, uh, zero, and four. If you have a, an even number that's equivalent to T being odd, you just plug the new idempotent in the middle. And if you have an even number of idempotents here, you have to replace the one that appears in the middle by the sum of the idempotent plus one minus E. And when doing so, you get a complete family of orthogonal idempotents, and it's classical that from a complete family of orthogonal idempotents, you have a set grading. The homogeneous components 
are obtained by the form F I R F J, where I minus J equals K. And all these possibilities, you sum all of them and you obtain the homogeneous component label by minus by K. So if you start with this uh, complete family, you, once it is complete, you have a label minus T here, and the highest uh, index you can subtract is the T here. So minus T minus T again gives you this homogeneous component label with a minus two. And the other way around, if you start here and you subtract the index of this other idempotent here, you end up with the homogeneous component here. Our question was, uh, where does our nilpotent last regular element live with respect to this grading? And the answer is, a part of it lives in the zero component, and another part of it, the one that gives the Jordan canonical form, the, 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 that big Jordan block, always lives in the component level by two. And since it is in a level by a two, then by taking powers, the last non-zero power always falls in this wing of the grading. All this construction can be done if you have an involution, and if the root inverse is compatible with the involution, you obtain a grading at the end that is compatible with the involution. So I can give you a couple of examples. For example, if the nilpotent last regular element has index three, we only have three idempotents. Suppose that this is not a complete set of orthogonal elements, so we need to introduce a new idempotent in the family. So we build E, which is E1 plus E2 plus E3, and we need to, intro to introduce this one minus E somewhere. So since we have three, we have to replace the one that is in the middle, E2, by E2 plus one minus C. E. And we end up with three idempotents that give exactly this grading. Starting from minus two, minus two, this is R minus four. And when uh, doing all the subtraction of indexes, we obtain this grading. And with respect to this grading, one part, one piece of A lives in the zero component and another piece of A lives in the second homogeneous component. If the nilpotent last regular element has an even index of nilpotency, then we have four idempotents. So we can directly plug the new idempotent, the completion y minus e in the middle. And instead of having four idempotents, we end up with five the one label with minus three, minus one, zero, one, and three. And with this, we get a grading starting in minus six, ending in six. And with respect to this grading, the piece of A of the form one minus E A is in the zero component, and E A is, as always, in the second component, and the last non-zero power goes to the wing to the right wing. So when we saw these situations, we wonder how these gradients could be adjusted such that the whole A belong to an homogeneous component. And to do so, our element has to satisfy an extra condition. Not only that it is nilpotent and the last non-zero power is regular, but we have to require that all the non-zero powers were regular. And with this condition, all the, well, in this case, the element is a sum of pieces, all of them being nilpotent last regular of decreasing indexes. And for any of these, a family of idempotents could be built and combining all that families of idempotent, we end up with a complete family of uh, idempotents such that the grading looks 
very similar to the one we had obtained in the previous cases, but this time the whole A belong to the second component. And uh, as before, the plus non-zero power went to away. Uh, obviously, if R has an involution and we take are very careful when picking the rules and the potents for any of these little nilpotent uh, last regular elements, we end up with a set grading that is compatible with the involution. So up to here, our study of uh, nilpotent last regular elements. And now let's go back to our original problem. Uh, because as I told you, we were interested in describing a certain type of adnilpotent elements. Those that had different index of adnilpotency when considered in the Lie algebra SQ of R and when considered in the whole Lie algebra R minus. And uh, as I told you, when moving to the symmetric Martindale ring of quotient, the element A was SQ uh, was an important of SQ index not only in the SQ symmetric elements of R but also in the SQ symmetric elements of the symmetric Martindale ring of quotients and moreover we had the extra condition remember this was the reason why we decided to study nilpotent last regular because they appear naturally here we could find a uh, uh, that we could prove that they were a, a von Neumann regular when considered as element in the symmetric Martindale ring of quotients. Uh, so uh, our element is nilpotent dash regular, not in R, but in S. So we can apply everything we know about the structure of S. And uh, the fact is that our element, when multiplied by its star rules, um, idempotent gave a grading in the associative structure S, labeled from minus 2t to 2t. Uh, as phi modules, the corners, the wings of these gradings are isomorphic in, in this situation to the standard centroid. And uh, a very peculiar thing that we found is that uh, when the grading was restricted to the symmetric uh, elements of the Martin Martindale ring of quotients, the gradient was shorter. The two wings, the k uh, minus two and the k uh, level by two t, disappear. And then we realized that we were re refining again the situation Olaf Smirnov had found when he was studying uh, gradings appear in Thelmanov uh, theorem or when he classified early algebras with a finite grading. Uh, after uh, Efim's work, uh, Oleg Spirnov uh, published a couple of papers where he deeply studied how the associative structure was, and he found that there were cases where the grading in the associative structure and the grading in the skew symmetric uh, elements were different. This was uh, of a certain length, and this one was shorter. So the same thing happens for us. Uh, the, the grading in S is longer than the grading in K. If uh, the, the wings, the, no, the non-zero homogeneous components of the wings of the grading in K is, are also um, uh, isomorphic to the standard centroid, and as before, uh, the ring ESE could be seen isomorphic uh, with an isomorphism uh, compatible with involution to uh, matrices of size K plus one over the centroid and the involution of this matrix ring could be uh, completely uh, um, described. So with all of this in hand, Thanks to our this theorem and our classifications of uh, adnilpotent elements, both in R minus and in SQ of R star, we could produce examples of any of the cases appear in our theorem for any of the possible powers of adnilpotency. 
our uh, examples were always matrices and they were given in rings of matrices of certain size and the involution in this matrix was very similar to the one I have uh, presented in the previous slide to this one here. So this was kind of an inspiration to find the examples. And an important thing is that we found an example that was missing in uh, the list of examples of uh, adnilpotent elements of the skew symmetric elements um, in a prime ring with involution that was given in Martindale and Mears uh, paper uh, of 1991. They thought they were giving an example of n congruent to four modulo, a uh, congruent to zero modulo four, but in, in fact, they were dealing the case n congruent to three modulo four two times because they were not uh, checking that the element they were giving uh, had that precise index. It was nilpotent, uh, it was killed by the power they said, but it was it, it was not at nilpotent of that power. So we could complete Martin de la Mer's classification of at nilpotent elements of uh, the skew symmetric elements uh, for a ring with involution, for a prime ring with involution. Another application. So when we found all these uh, set gradings, that remi remind us to, to the works of Jacobson about SL2 triples. Uh, there is a paper by Nathan Jacobson of uh, 1958, uh, where the title is a note on three-dimensional simple Lie algebra. It resembles to be something very Lie, but indeed it has a, a a great amount of combinatorial things in associative algebras. And uh, there he studied uh, conditions satisfied by three elements in a ring behaving like an SL2. So E times F with respect to the usual bracket in, in an associative structure gave H, H, E gave uh, two times E, and H, F gave uh, minus two times F. So this behaves like an SL2 triple. And he proved that whenever you have one of these SL2 triples, if one of the E or F, let's say E, is nilpotent of a certain index, then the element in the middle, the H, satisfies a concrete polynomial. To do so, uh, he imposed a certain restriction on the characteristic of the ring of scholars. But anyway, he proved that uh, the element H uh, satisfied this polynomial. And with this in hand, he could prove, or it's not difficult to show, that uh, the adjoint map associated to H is diagonalizable. diagonalizable and induces a grading with respect to uh, the eigenspaces of the adjoint map associated to H. So there is an, a, an associated grading when having these SL2 triples and one of the sides being um, nilpotent. So we, our idea was do uh, our gradings, our set gradings has to do anything with this grading given by the eigenspaces with respect to this adjoint map, or it's something completely uh, apart one from the other? And the, the answer is that they are closely related. If you start with an important large regular element and you take a root inverse associated to A and you take the associated root idempotent, then EA can be completed to an SL2 triple, the element H and the element F can be es expressed easily with respect to our matrix units. They can be computed. And when it is defined F like this and H like this, it is easy to see that H times this element gives twice this element, H times this element gives minus two, two times uh, F, and the product of the extremes recovers H. So it is an SL2. And what is more, the grading with respect to the eigenspaces, 
is a coarsening of the set gradient we had previously obtained when studying nilpotent blast regular. Furthermore, if the original element is not only nilpotent blast regular, but it is nilpotent and all the non-zero powers are regular, then not only this part of A, but the whole of A can be completed to an SL2 triple in the sense of Jacobson. So this is nilpotent, this is an SL2 triple, and we obtain that the grading with respect to the eigenspaces of the adjoint map associated to H is a coarsening of our set grading. And the other way around also works. If we start with the situation Jacobson had in his paper, that was uh, an SN2 triple, such that the element A was nilpotent, requiring some conditions on the torsion of the ring of scalars, we can prove that A to the K is von Neumann regular for every power. And the main tool is going through nilpotent plus regular elements. And just as a final application of our nilpotent plus regular, is uh, obtaining certain conditions about ring of bounded index. So we say that a ring has bounded index if all nilpotent elements, if every nilpotent element of that ring has uh, is nilpotent of at most a certain quantity, quantity. So suppose we are in that situation. And let us suppose that we have a nilpotent large regular element of maximal index. Well, in this situation, we can say many things about the ring. Uh, most of the results I'm going to put here were already known in the literature, but with our techniques of nilpotent plus regular, they were very easy to, to be proven. Uh, the first thing is that if our uh, nilpotent plus regular element has maximal index, then the root inverse the root idempotent this time is unique. It's, it, it does not depend on the choice of the root inverse. It, it's always a, one element and it is central. And what is more, in this uh, isomorphism relating ERE -E -R -E with a ring of matrices, the coefficients never have never can be nilpotent. Furthermore, if uh, the ring is, is itself von Neumann regular, then we can say a little more about the coefficients, and it is that uh, the coefficients form an abelian regular ring, where abelian regular means that all the idempotents are central. If the original ring is in the composable, then we directly obtain that the root idempotent, which uh, I told you it was unique and central, this time is the identity. So our ring it has an identity and it can be seen as a ring of matrices where S is unital without nilpotent elements. I have uh, remarked this condition or this result in bold font because we haven't found it in the literature, so it may be a new description. If R is prime of bounded index and you have an important last regular element of maximal index, then R is a ring of matrices where S is a unital domain. And if we combine these two results, uh, in, no, if you combine this result, von Neumann regular and in the composable, we obtain that R was isomorphic to a ring of matrices over a division ring. I think that this result, this result, and this result was already known and can be found in, in books about ring theory, but we hadn't found this description of prime rings of bounded index until, until we introduce it in the, in the theory. So I'm um, getting to the end of my talk. This is uh, the set of papers where you can find the results I have talked about. And uh, this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
uh, questions. Maybe in the chat. Well, I have a question, but yeah. maybe you have answered it in the in the at the end of the talk. My mm -hmm. question was, uh, what happens if that Rus inverse is unique? Can you say something about the element A if it admits only the unique? Yeah. Inverse? Okay, uh, I don't remember exactly now, but uh, in the paper, let me let me share the. I'm sharing the okay in this one. Yes. In the paper about the Jordan canonical form, the, the second one, uh, we had several results of what happened when the Rus inverse was unique, when the idempotent was unique, because in those cases we, we could uh, give more information. Okay, so uh, uh, and again related to your last slide, uh, as far as I understood, in the matrix ring, yes, in, this, in the matrix ring over a field, these rules inverse are unique, or you know, uh, as you say that if R is prime, then R is isomorphic to the matrix ring, or it's. But you you need to have a. A uh, ring of mountain the ah. an element which is nilpotent as regular of the highest power possible. So ring of bounded index means yes. nilpotent ring. No, um, no, 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 no. It, it is that all nilpotent elements have a bounded ah, ring. Ah, okay, okay. So well, so in a field there were well, there is only one nilpotent element. Yeah, well, there, there are nilpotent elements uh, in a matrix ring, you say. The size yeah. of the so of okay. The if, if I if I, can I take R to be a field, so I have only one nilpotent element. But you want the other way around, starting with a matrix ring, not the smart yes, matrix. yes, starting with a matrix ring over a field. Yeah, okay, so, so and, that's and the I, situation, yes, and I take an important element in this matrix ring. So, yes, so what happens? What's is it? Is it well, no, the, the root inverse mean? is not unique. Uh -huh. uh, let me go back to, 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 to let me say, for example, uh, in the first example I gave here. Uh -huh. so yes. This is a matrix ring, put here uh, whatever you want. This is yes. a root inverse, but if yes. you have another one here, it behaves like a root inverse. Another one in, in the last column. No, for maybe. example, here, or for example, here. So you, you, can ha you have a lot of choices to put uh -huh. an extra one and, and everything works also. Okay, so so, it's yeah. not easy to to have that uniqueness. Uh, okay, and some example of rings where it's unique. Do you have some simple examples of? Well, the, the one in the last. Uh... Okay, so it's. But uh, it, it has. But again, to it has some. It gives some prop some some necessary properties. But I, I what I'm interested in is like, as as and and. Specific example, but ex explicit example for ring for which it's unique. For example. Oh, well, for example, oh, yes, okay. Uh, what we are saying here is that the Rus idempotent is not unique, but no, sorry, the Rus inverse is not unique, but the Rus idempotent it is unique. Mm -hmm. And even in the example I have shown you about matrices, haven't the the Rus idempotent was the identity because it mm -hmm. is unique. The, the idempotent is unique, not the inverse. But no, since okay. we are always interested in describing E R E, if this is the, the number one, this is the unit, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. fully describe the ring R. Oh, yes. And that was what happened in our example. It was, uh, let me say, it was like, uh, I think it was, no, sorry. Here, okay, okay, let me see, here. Uh, no, no, this, uh, here. Mm -hmm. Even if the root inverse could, could be moved and put more ones over here, when we add up all the little idempotents, we obtain mm -hmm. the identity because okay. it's, it's, we are in the better situation. It is the only one, it is the, the identity in the ring. Okay, so yeah, so the, the root inverse can be non unique, but the idempotent in this situation when, is. When, when the ring is good, it's very mm -hmm. good, yes, then yes. it is yeah. unique. Okay. So the description is not so strange because you 
what we are always describing is ERE. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, you are interested more in that local mm -hmm. ring. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, so we thank Esther again. Thank you very much. And I think we can stop. Okay. And